Hello, everyone, and welcome to Brain Math. This seminar series is co-sponsored by the P41 funded Center for Mesoscale Mapping housed in the Martino Center. It is my great pleasure to introduce our speaker today, Dr. Hong Yu An. Dr. Hong Yu An is a professor at the Malin Court Institute of Radiology with an affiliated appointment in neurobiology, biomedical imaging, and ESE, and the division of Biology and Biomedical Sciences at Washington University in St. Louis. She's the director of the Biomedical Magnetic Resonance Center and the associate director of the Center for Clinical Imaging Research. Dr. N's research is focused on MR imaging and combined PET MR imaging. Her research interests include MR oxygen metabolic imaging, perfusion, diffusion imaging, and PET MR quantitative all 15 water, all 15 pet imaging to study cerebral vascular disease, including acute ischemic stroke, sick cell disease, and cerebral small vessel disease. I would like to remind our audience to please address any questions using Q&A box or raise a hand, raise their hand. And Dr. Hong Yuan, thank you for very much for coming today and virtual stage is yours now. Thank you very much uh, for the kind introduction, and uh, thank you very much for inviting me uh, inviting me to this uh, exciting series. And um, uh, it's a great pleasure to speak to this audience. Uh, also, it's an honor. And um, today, I'm going to talk about uh, like uh, how we may do imaging about the cerebral uh, oxygen uh, metabolism. Um, so before I start, um, um, I had a role as a consultant uh, for Pfizer and um, for some of their sickle cell uh, like a trial. And um, that that's um, I would like to disclose that before I start. And so first um, the outline of my talk today, and um, I will very briefly talk about the cerebral oxygen metabolism and also uh, some PET and the MRI methods uh, to measure uh, cerebral oxygen metabolism. Uh, including CBF, uh, OEF, and the CMR2. And then after that, I will uh, discuss several um, clinical applications. And for example, how we may use those uh, imaging biobanker in acute ischemic stroke, in sickle cell anemia, and also several small vessel disease. So oxygen metabolism is uh, critical for neu neuronal activities. Uh, brain only comprises about 2% of the total, total body weight, but it consumes 20% of the uh, body oxygen. So it's a very demanding organ and just to support the neuronal function. Uh, abnormal oxygen metabolism occurs in many neurological diseases, uh, including um, acute ischemic stroke, uh, sickle cell disease, Several uh, small vessel disease, um, like an intracranial stenosis, uh, corded artery occlusion, moya moya, trauma, and other things. And then when we talk about um, cerebral oxygen metabolism, we are really talking about the three different parameters, uh, including uh, CPF, OEF, and the CMO2. And then the traditional definition of CMO2 is uh, OEF times. CBF times CO2. CO2 is the arterial oxygen content. Um, so if you uh, take CBF times C CO2, that's pretty much like the supply and um, oxygen supply to the brain tissue. And, and then um, CMO2 is kind of more like a, how much um, it may consume. And then the OEF is kind of the balance between these two. So um, about the imaging, um, like a typically an O15 pad can be utilized for that. And also there are several different MR imaging approaches um, that can be used for this too. Um, for O15 pad, um, there is a very classic uh, method to do that. And, and it's called the triple pack O15 pad. It's uh, like a quite um, accepted and reference for quantitative oxygen imaging for in vivo tissue. And however, and 
because O15 tracers need to be used, and while O15 tracer only have about two minutes half life time, uh, so a on site cyclotron facility is uh, required in order to do O15 PET imaging. On the other hand, um, based on MR and um, different ways of doing that, uh, we can use, for example, dynamic accessibility contrast or arterial spin labeling to get CBF information. Um, and then the paramagnetic deoxy hemoglobin, uh, which is uh, uh, the endogenous MR contrast and typically people use it for the both the contrast and can be used um, to look at the oxygenation or tissue oxygenation. And then uh, to start with an um, O15 pack and the triple pack approach. And so typically for CPF uh, measurement, and um, we use O15 labeled water and like uh, with that bolus injection, and you can just uh, scan the patient brain um, over several minutes. And if uh, one compound model with a freely diffusible tracer is used, um, and then with known arterial input function, um, based on this equation, you can get um, CBF, which is F here. And then this method was developed uh, quite a while ago, and actually decades ago. Um, by a group of investigators at WashU. And then um, another piece, uh, which is quite important uh, for the O15 PET uh, estimation of OEF and CML2 is CBV. Uh, you may not know why, but I will show that later. So the CBV um, typically is uh, um, obtained using uh, like a O15 labeled CO gas. And, and then this uh, tracer binds to hemoglobin. And typically, um, the subject will just take a brief inhalation of the gas. And then a steady state method can be used uh, to quantify CBV. And then this is, um, uh, this is the equation that uh, we can use to quantify CBV. And then the last one out of the triple pack, an um, <clears throat> O15 scan is uh, an O15 labeled O2 gas and, and also an HI inhalation study. <clears throat> For the dynamic O15 gas study, and typically it also requires a brief inhalation. And then with that two compartment model, as I put a like a <clears throat> figure here. And so like the O15 uh, gas get through the, the vessel and uh, that compartment, and then got uh, transported to the tissue, got uh, consumed uh, or metabolized. And then and then you can collect some signal at the same time and the like a water and as the product of the um, metabolism will also recirculate back and, and also contribute some signal. So giving this model, um, there are, um, this is a sort of the equation that we can use for that. So if you look at this equation, uh, you'll probably start to understand why um, we, we need CBF in this model as well as CBV uh, for some correct, uh, correction. So like uh, uh, with the CBF, CBV already measured using the O15 water and the O15 uh, CO, and, and then also using the PET uh, counts uh, from the OO uh, experiment, uh, we can calculate the OEF. Um, so this is the, um, the triple pack, and then after, we get the CBF, uh, CBV, and OEF, and then CML2 can be um, computed as a product of uh, like a OEF times CBF times CO2, uh, which can also be measured like a from blood or can be calculated. And then an um, MRI, it's a completely different physics. And so I will just um, go through some of the key components that we need for that. So first there would be uh, MR-based uh, CBF. Um, so there are mainly two um, different uh, methods that can be used for MR-based uh, CBF um, like uh, estimation. So one is uh, called uh, MR dynamic accessibility contrast or this DSC perfusion imaging. So I have a little movie here to show uh, the MRI images uh, acquired uh, before, during, and after an MR conscious injection. So on the left is uh, uh, the time series from a normal subject. On the 
on the right is uh, um, the MRDSC images from a stroke patients. So if you look at the, the equation and to um, govern the, um, you know, the signal or you can call it a concentration curve uh, of MR contrast agent. So it's basically um, C concentration in the tissue and um, CA of T, which is an um, arterial um, input function. And in, in this particular case here, time size residue function, and then it's proportional to CDF. And then with that, um, with a, like a single um, value of decomposition method and um, originally proposed by Ostgard, um, and then later there's a circular um, SVD method uh, was proposed by Anna Wu uh, at all, and you can then get um, the CDF calculation. And then there's another class of um, like a CDF measurement um, based on uh, arterial spin labeling. And for this is just a very simple way to show how arterial spin labeling may work. And so in this case, uh, typically we got a pair of uh, MR images, uh, like a control and um, versus a label. So the differences between these two um, is proportional to CDF. And through the past maybe two or three decades, um, people have developed um, different variations of ASL method. And if you look at the, um, the way how people uh, use um, MR to label the blood, and there are three classes like uh, um, post ASL, continuous um, ASL, or pseudo continuous ASL. And then for acquisition side, um, there, you could use 2D EPI or 3D GRACE uh, readout. And then for post-label delay, and um, people can use a single post-label delay or multi-post-label delay. Um, and then um, again, for 3D GRACE readout, um, a lot of people use background suppression, and that has some benefit of improving SNR and also uh, be less sensitive to motion. So this is um, like a, a big class of um, methods, um, but with uh, quite um, different variations here. And then um, switch gear and a little bit to um, how we may be able to uh, measure oxygenation. And so I, I just put up uh, like a very simple way of um, looking at the different vessels, uh, what, depending on the size of the vessels, uh, what's going on here. And then, so you can see um, for major veins and um, potentially we can use intravascular effect to do that. And then for like uh, uh, very small vessels and a lot of time um, people kind of focus on the extravascular effect. And then in between and um, there's a um, vessel and um, we, we can look into the partial volume effect. So, uh, also, again, in the past two, the two decades, uh, there are a lot of methods have been proposed and um, uh, like uh, to uh, estimate tissue oxygenation. Um, so like uh, roughly, uh, you can group them into, um, I would say two categories. Uh, one is considered as a global measurement. So basically it's a, a single value per brain. And, and then there are also methods um, focusing on more regional measurement. And, and then um, Deng Rongjiang and uh, Han Zhang Lu um, put together a very nice review paper uh, just published uh, not long ago to review many different methods here. And then I'm just borrowing their table to show like um, depending on um, the contrast mechanism, uh, you can really use T2-based approach or uh, phase. And remember MR is always a complex signal. We can use phase information um, either for global um, or some QSM method for regional Q both. And, and then this is more like a dual calibration uh, functional MRI way of doing that. There are um, assumptions in, in every one of these methods. And, and then also there are pros and the cons. Uh, so if you are very interested in knowing um, like um, all kinds of methods, um, I suggest you to read that review paper and then maybe find the original publication. So like um, for, for my talk today, I'm going to focus on the, the Q-Bold um, approach. And so like for the Q-Bold approach, there are uh, several assumptions here. Um, so first it's considered like a static defacing. And 
no diffusion effects across magnetic field is included in this case. And, and also uh, the intravascular effect is considered small. Uh, so, um, so in the model and the intravascular effect is not included. And also the blood vessel uh, assumed um, to have full random orientation uh, so that the angle dependence um, like uh, basically dropped out. Um, and then there are um, like uh, different MR pulse sequences you can use um, to, um, to get the signal and then uh, use the biophysical model uh, to estimate um, the OEF. So like uh, there are, uh, we've tried both the uh, gradient uh, sampled uh, spin echo uh, at the beginning and then later move to a symmetric spin echo sequence. And then in this particular um, like approach and the R2 prime, and it, it's actually has a pretty uh, simple relationship with um, and the susceptibility um, from the blood uh, or DFC hemoglobin, uh, as well as uh, um, what we call it uh, VCBV, some people call it the D, uh, like a BV, uh, which is the one uh, blood volume fraction um, from the, the deoxy hemoglobin. And so this is our equation. And, and then <clears throat> based on that, based on some uh, signal, then you can calculate the, uh, like a Y or uh, sometimes OEF it's just one minus Y, assuming the um, like a arterial um, blood is fully oxygenated. And, and then with this, um, we, we basically say, uh, now let's uh, um, see what we can do. Like uh, if you can get CDF and OEF, then um, we, we sort of have a parameter we call it an um, oxygen, MR-based oxygen metabolic index, an um, OMI, which is a particle of this two. So compared to the CMR2, the traditional uh, definition, uh, like uh, we have a CO2 is not here, but that one can be easily um, included either by some measurement or um, you, you can calculate it out. And then this is the sequence um, that we used and uh, the ASE sequence we used um, for this. So for, for this particular sequence, as you can see, you have a, a 90 pulse and the 180 pulse. And then instead of putting the 180 pulse right at the T over two, we can move the 180 pulse uh, towards to the left. So in this case, then you generate some image contrast based on the signal decay. Um, and then if I put a, a little ROI here, and this is the signal equation that we get, like uh, all the dots that you can see they are uh, major the signal. And then if you look at the, um, um, like uh, the, the pink line versus the green line, they are faded the one. And then through the differences between these two, uh, we can get an um, VCBV. And then by combining R2 prime and the VCBV, then we can get OEF. So this is uh, just uh, like a very rough comparison between what you may expect. Like uh, unlike CDF, OEF actually is quite flat. So it was uh, um, shown um, many years ago by the PAD-015 studies. And also for MRI study, you would also expect like a uh, like pretty flat um, like OEF. So basically there are not much of uh, differences between gray versus white and um, like matters. Uh, if it's everything is normal. And then we also did some um, validation study in rats. So in this case, um, we um, have the rats to breathe room air and that's considered as a baseline. And then we also uh, induce um, moderate and the severe hypoxia and also have uh, hypercapnia. And then um, we use the blood gas um, from the superior central centers as the uh, gold standard reference and then compare uh, the MR measurements. So this is like, a, if you can see here, this is x-axis here is the MR measured uh, oxygen saturation. And then the y-axis here is the blood gas oxygen saturation. And then just keep that in mind, like uh, the original PET validation and um, it's also done using blood gas. And as you can see, uh, for a pretty wide range, um, there's a pretty good correlation uh, between this um, MR-based approach uh, versus the blood gas uh, uh, measured oxygen saturation. And then we also did some uh, hypercapnic study uh, in normal subjects. Um, 
And then in this case, um, you can see uh, we run five different episodes um, by switching between uh, room air and the uh, um, CO enriched gas and to induce hypercapnia. And then you can see control, hypercapnia, control, hypercapnia, and then going back to control again. And, and then as expected um, for hypercapnia, uh, you would see CBF is increased and, and then um, at the same time, uh, OEF will be reduced while the o, like a CMO2 or OMI will remain roughly unchanged. Um, so this is what normally people consider hypercapnic is isometabolic. And um, so that means um, CBF increase and OEF decrease at a similar level, then you got the uh, same CMO2 or OMI. And then there are also um, like some efforts in trying to compare PET and MRI. Um, and then this is about the CPF. And, and so like uh, published by Zhang et al. Uh, in 2014 uh, using PET MRI. So as you can see, like uh, generally speaking, an um, MR and the PET CPF, they correlate quite well. Um, but if you uh, look at the data closely, so this is uh, for whole brain, white matter, gray matter, you can see that actually the ASL CBF uh, are greater than um, PET CBF in this particular study here. And there's a um, there was another study um, done by the um, Copenhagen group, and um, so they induce um, different CBF states uh, like a uh, resting. Those are kind of like uh, just um, the subject um, or just uh, like a baseline, and then you have. Uh, uh, hyperventilation for low flow, and also um, for um, oxytocinolamide um, for high flow. So you can see, like a for like an entire range, and um, there's a pretty good correlation. Uh, but if you look at the, each individual flow states, and um, you can sort of see the the slope is not really one. And as you can see, read out from the figure here. And this is the blend element test. And also um, some of the show that uh, for higher flow and um, seems like a, an MR-based approach and uh, tend to provide a higher number. Um, so in summary, um, generally speaking, good correlation, um, but there are some differences uh, between an um, MR and the PET-based approach. And um, how about an OEF comparison? And then, um, I, I mentioned a little bit about the trust um, method. It's a global uh, OEF measurement. Uh, so like just to get a, uh, get into a little bit more details of what this method really measure. So what it does is it singled out using the control uh, minus label um, of the sepulchral sinus. Um, and then you can use different echo time uh, to measure the, the R2 in this case, or one of R2 or one of our T2 is R2. And, and then through our calibration, then you can get um, like a oxygen uh, saturation. And then here, um, based on this paper, this is the OEF map um, from O15 um, pad um, that they acquired. And, and then like I think this is a single value uh, measurement um, from uh, so sinus. So they just um, do an average of the whole brain and pad OEF map and then compare. And then in this case, you can see also there's a quite good correlation here. And the blend element test and plots also show um, actually it's a quite tight um, like a range between the, these two different methods. And um, and then there's another uh, phase-based global OEF uh, measurement uh, in like uh, peak models. And this is called the OxyFlow. And, and then they reported that um, like uh, the MR-based approach um, provides roughly 30% of OEF compared to the PET whole brain. So again, this is a global measurement and, and then they sum up the, the whole brain and voxel-based OEF to compare to. So like from the mean value, they look uh, pretty similar, but the paper didn't report uh, uh, more than that. Um, and then there's another like a uh, um, regional uh, based approach called the QBOLD plus QSM or in short uh, called the QQ method. 
and and then there's also a reported uh, like a similar range of uh, MR based approach uh, versus the PET based approach. And then we uh, we have to look at the like uh, the OEF or the CBF or CMO2 as uh, potentially imaging biomarkers. And then the test rate has repeatability uh, can become uh, become very important if you try to follow up. Uh, patients longitudinally or to look at the uh, treatment response. Um, and then uh, looking at the, uh, the method here, so this is all like a MR-based approach based on the ASE. And, and then you can see like we look into the whole brain, gray matter, white matter, and then there's another region we call it the watershed, which um, is a region and has the lowest flow uh, within the white matter. And then, as you can see from here, we look at the intersection and the intersection. And so it's about the 2% uh, across. And like our watershed is a little bit worse, um, but overall speaking, um, they are pretty good. Um, and then look at the pad just as a comparison uh, reported in the literature um, for the whole brain um, pad. The intersection is about 6%, and intersection is always uh, slightly bigger because that's day to day. And it's about nine point something uh, percent, and then uh, the intersubject, uh, and certainly you know, and there there's some variation across patients as well. And and then if uh, you look at the uh, 3D single PLD Picasso, um, so let's just focus on the intersection for now. And uh, you can see um, it, it's about the um, like about eight to ten percent for major uh, regions like a whole brain, gray matter, white matter. And for watershed, uh, as I mentioned, and this is the region with the extremely uh, low flow. And then you start to see uh, quite a um, large, uh, like a winning subject uh, coefficient of, of variations. So this is from uh, healthy young participants. And so if uh, we look at the elderly participants with uh, uh, several small vessel disease, and, and then again, based on the MR-based approach, um, so you can see um, they, they slightly a bit higher than what um, you, you see from the healthy young participants. And, and then we also, uh, in this case, we use uh, five different post-label delay Picasso. And then um, the, the value here are um, somewhat comparable to a single PLD, uh, 3D Picasso. And then if you look at the CMO2, which is a product of both an uh, OEF and CBF, you, you sort of can see this is a very similar to um, CBF, uh, which means uh, the variation in C uh, CMO2 in this particular case uh, is primarily driven by CBF. And then um, for the next part, I'm going to um, discuss uh, several clinical applications. And, particularly uh, in uh, stroke, uh, sickle cell, and also cerebral small vessel disease. So for acute um, ischemic stroke, um, like uh, many of you probably are very familiar with the notion that time is brain. Um, but on the other hand, um, this timing, time is brain, may work differently for severe stroke uh, versus moderate stroke. Um, and then like uh, the standard treatment for stroke patients is if the patient um, arrived the hospital within 4.5 hours after onsite, and then um, typically IV TPA uh, would be provided to the patients. But because of this very short treatment window, uh, a very small percentage of patients uh, um, can be treated um, due to this limitation here. And then um, for endovascular, from Bactomy, and and then actually it can go beyond uh, the very strict uh, four point five um, like a window. So typically, um, within six hours, uh, patient with large vessel occlusion they got treated uh, treated uh, without really imaging selection. And then there there are study uh, proposing um, like a further extend the therapeutic window like a to up to twenty four hours. Uh, but in this case, um, we need to use imaging to select patient to see who um, may get the most benefit out of this. And then the, the <clears throat> we, we sort of look at the um, this whole uh, oxygen metabolism during ischemic. Uh, want to understand what's going on here. 
and so like a, and for the brain, it has a pretty good uh, like auto regulate and uh, reg regulation. So with a pretty uh, wide range of perfusion pressure, uh, the CBF actually can be maintained. And and then in this case, uh, OEF yeah, for CML2, they all just um, like um, normal. And well, if uh, ischemic uh, stroke occurs, and then and if there's a cushion, then you expect uh, a reduction in CBF. And then as a way to compensate for the reduction of CBF and OEF would increase, and so that still maintain a relative uh, speaking like a normal CMO2. And this is and some people uh, termed this phenomenon as a misery perfusion. But however, if um, the flow continues to go down, well, OEF already somewhat reach its maximum, and then the compensation just no longer work, and then CMO2 will be reduced, and, and then the tissue will have trouble, right? And then <clears throat> there, like for <clears throat> ischemic stroke, the reason why we need to treat the patient is uh, and their ischemic the tissues, they have a reversible injury. Uh, well, if we, uh, either we wait for too long, or uh, there's no effective treatment, then those uh, reversible injury become irreversible. So the idea is like whether we can use um, CMO2 or OMI2 and um, like a differentiated uh, tissue that can be salvaged. So for, for this, this is what we normally call it uh, um, like a tissue at risk or penumbra. And then this is sort of the classical view of penumbra is uh, uh, if the ischemic is too severe, then it, it, you basically just see the core, which is irreversible. And while for penumbra, and it's reversible, and then above that, that will be oligemia is slightly uh, normal, but even you don't trade, it's probably okay. But some people also say uh, oligemia maybe over time and can be recruited into penumbra as well. Um, so like a, uh, if you sort of like a giving uh, the, the tissue status, which what we call it the core penumbra oligemia versus the uh, treatment status, and then you can make up a table like this. So for core, and the reason why it's called core is irreversible. So whether you treat the tissue or not treat the tissue, the tissue died anyway. And um, well, for penumbra, is the treatment really make a big difference. And if the tissue got an effective reperfusion, and it may survive. If it does not, it, it will die. And then for leukemia, uh, the general way of defining that is it survives, and it's very mild, it will survive. Um, so the goal here is really um, try to identify penumbra and um, that not just the dead tissue, uh, for example, and um, core, it's nice to know uh, where the core is, but really the point is uh, where we can find the penumbra that the treatment can make an impact. Um, and then we, we look into MROMI as a way to identify penumbra. Um, so like uh, coming back to the table again, uh, so using the MROMI based approach, and uh, we can get an uh, infarct probability uh, in the sort of uh, the core area close to 100%. That means uh, pretty much all the tissue uh, considered as core, they all died. Um, and then for the penumbra, and then for the, the treated, uh, the infarct probability is really reduced from almost 90% to 10%. And this is a huge difference, as you can see. And then for tissue with benign or leukemia, the infarct probability actually is quite low. And then like, uh, this is a sort of the, the method we, we've been um, like, uh, looked into. And then there are other approaches, um, like uh, for example, the diffusion perfusion mismatch, uh, which is the diffuse two criteria. And um, so you can see for the core, it does uh, very well to identify core. Um, but for penumbra, as you can see, the differences for the reperfused penumbra and the infarct probability rate is quite low. Uh, well, for the non-reperfused one, it's about 50%. So for 50% um, of penumbra, 
it survived any uh, regardless of the perfusion. That basically means it overestimated the per number of years. And the oligemia is uh, quite good. And then if we compare uh, this to that, and there's a significance um, in terms of the prediction um, like uh, accuracy. And then if we somewhat uh, optimize uh, the diffusion perfusion mismatch, uh, we can get uh, like a better results uh, in, in this uh, category here. Uh, but if we compare this to that, and there's still uh, uh, quite, quite a significant difference here. And, and then, so giving um, the tissue fate, and then you can pretty much say the prediction error, right? So if you got the A as a hundred percent, that means the pre prediction error is uh, uh, zero and it's perfect. And, and then same thing here is uh, for this, you expect to perfect one will be zero, perfect one will be 100, perfect one here will be zero. Then you can calculate average the prediction error. And then we, we sort of look at the, um, the differences here is uh, the lower number, the better. So you can see um, the based on the oxygenation metabolism based approach, and um, it's uh, um, predict things better than the diffusion perfusion mismatch or the diffuse two criteria. And then we also look at the neurological outcome and just to see uh, whether they are different or not. And for example, if you know um, there are a lot of reperfused, uh, like a penumbra, uh, you would say the uh, reperfused penumbra, the higher that number would be, um, it will um, correlate better with better neurological outcome, right? So if you look at the modified ranking scale, scale, like a zero to one, that's considered better, and then three to six, it considered worse. So you can see a significant uh, higher, um, like a reperfused penumbra, and well, like a, there are not uh, differences between the DPM-based uh, approach. And then if we look at the this um, as, like a, as a correlation with uh, Delta NIH SS score, and then you can also see there's a, a linear or not, some regression or association here. And well, there's no um, association between the uh, DPM identified uh, reperfused penumbra. And then the next um, clinical application I'm going to talk about is uh, sickle cell an anemia. And, <clears throat> and for sickle cell, it's uh, like a genetic, uh, genetic disorder. And one in 1,000 newborn, um, like uh, will have that, and it's particularly um, like a like a you you will see more cases in African Americans. So it's a one in uh, three sixty five um, like a newborn babies they may have sickle cell anemic condition. Uh, so the problem of this disease is uh, a mutation in the beta globin gene, and that leads to hemoglobin S, which and um, you know, this is the sickle cell hemoglobin. And, and then it, it may be um, polymerized uh, into chains and that can change the shape of the red blood cell. And also it changed the hemoglobin's uh, oxygen affinity. And then uh, many sickle cell patients, uh, they develop silent uh, several infarctions. And, and then th this is a big burden for uh, patients uh, who uh, who have sickle cell, they have life uh, long physical and the cognitive, uh, cognitive disability. Um, so, like a, um, there was a <clears throat> trial and um, from enrolled about uh, close to three hundred patients, and so this is called the silent infarct uh, transfusion trial. So, like a, um, for the silent infarct, uh, their flare images tend to have uh, hyper intensity. So if you generate a lesion uh, heat map, then you can see that actually lesion, there, there are some um, regional vulnerability here. So they tend to like uh, have some distribution um, at a region we normally call it a um, watershed region. So this is just uh, uh, like a figure to show uh, the watershed region are uh, defined by major artery uh, territories. So they are the border zone of major artery uh, territories. So uh, in those cases, uh, and they are 
most vulnerable because uh, the flow can be easily disturbed. Uh, and then we, we sort of look into the CPF and the OEF in sickle cell patients. And, and then, so this is a sort of like a plot and that you can see with infarct burden and OEF tends to be higher, while CPF tends to be lower. So uh, with this observation, uh, we hypothesize that the tissue, um, like a, particularly with a lot of vulnerability, they may have what we call it the oxygen uh, stress. And then if you look at the controls uh, versus the sickle cell disease patients, uh, there's a, like an increase in CPF uh, because uh, they tend to be anemic. And then um, the hemoglobin S offload oxygen a lot easy, uh, more easily compared to hemoglobin A. And, and then and on, on the other hand, if you look at the whole brain OEF uh, for sickle cell disease, and um, they also tend to have higher number. And, and then, so this is the table to um, summarize um, whole brain, gray matter, white matter. So you'll see this uh, across the whole brain. Um, and by the way, we see that more particularly uh, in white matter. And then uh, what about um, if you provide um, this modifier treatment uh, to the patient, what's going to happen to the CPF and OEF? So um, here are examples that you can see, this is like a, a no transfusion, not transfuse the patient. Uh, and then this is a patient um, with transfusion, but the before transfusion, and then this is the post-transfusion scan that we did. And as you can see, um, before the transfusion, the blood flow uh, was high. And then after that, the blood flow uh, got reduced. And then, so again, this is treatment naive, and you can see very high OEF, particularly in the white matter region. And, and then for this patient, the, before the transfusion, you also see a um, bit higher number, uh, but not as high as the other one. And, and then uh, after the transfusion, uh, the OEF also got reduced. And then um, this is a, another study that we look at the no treatment and um, patient treated uh, using um, hydroxyurea uh, or transfusion. And so you can sort of see um, the high OEF, which is color coded here. Um, with different threshold, you can sort of see uh, the region and depending on um, the threshold that we use. Um, and then for hydroxyurea, treatment, you can see this region become much reduced or the higher OEF region got much reduced. And then for transfusion, uh, there's a sort of a weighted uh, like a effect that the transfusion uh, reduces even more. And then uh, the table uh, also summarized uh, that finding here. And then we also look at the, um, like a stem cell transplant treatment and, and also compared to chronic uh, transfusion study. and then. And this is like a look at here, this is CPF. So like a, for, um, before the treatment, after the treatment, you can see the CPF got uh, reduced. And, and then this is the uh, transplant before and after. So you can see a, like a much bigger range of drop. And, and then this is the control. And then on the other hand, if you look at the OEF and the transfusion reduced that and very consistent with uh, what I showed in the previous two slides. And, and then uh, if you look at the transplant and the reduction is certainly a lot more. And, and then there are also um, quite many studies um, like uh, in sickle cell using different approach. Uh, for example, um, trust OEF has been used uh, quite often uh, by actually multiple groups and trying to see um, like how the oxygenation in the superior sagittal sinus. And, and then, as I mentioned, and there's a conversion uh, using T2 to Y uh, calibration curve. Uh, so then you can uh, get R2 or T2, and then you can get um, the Y. Um, the original calibration was done um, by Han Zhang Lu, and they, he used a bovine model for that. And, and then later, um, the UC, um, like uh, Zhang Wu's group um, did the uh, human hemoglobin A calibration, so published in 2017. And then later, um, his group and also uh, Hopkins group, they combined data 
they uh, came up a uh, hemoglobin S uh, model uh, like that. And then just to recap a little bit, and um, the ASE based approach um, based on R2 prime, and, and then this is sort of uh, the equation that uh, we use um, to uh, derive oxygenation or OEF from R2 prime. And, and then in this one, we also need to know the delta chi zero, which is the bulk of volume sensibility in order to uh, link R2 prime to Y. And then we did an actual vivo measurement and then uh, found the no difference between hemoglobin A and the hemoglobin S. But um, coming back to the trust method, um, really depending on what calibration and curve was used, you could get the opposite uh, direction and like uh, results. So in this case, the bovine model was used. You can see sickle cell disease patients, they have higher OEF. While if you use the Lee Bush model, then the OEF actually is reduced. So this is all from the same patients, and but same uh, R2 measurement, but um, because of the differences in calibration, uh, you could get uh, quite a different results. So we did a study, we tried to um, understand the better, like uh, how the regional based approach versus the whole brain, like trust uh, um, may, you know, compare uh, in our own cohorts. Uh, so we recruited um, controls as well as patients um, with and without the transfusion. And, and then, so if we use, uh, look at the controls, if we use the bovine model, so you can see actually a quite a nice correlation between SE and the trust OEF. And if we look at the hemoglobin A model, and like in the trust, we, we also can see a, like a good correlation and not as good as this one, but still a significant correlation between uh, these two methods uh, in normal controls. Uh, well, if we look at the, um, the sickle cell uh, patients, if we use the bovine model, then you can see a, a very good uh, positive correlation. Um, but if we use the hemoglobin S, the Lee Bush model, uh, basically it's flat and there's no uh, correlation. So it's quite puzzling. And we, we really um, do not have a like perfect explanation of what um, happened there. And like, a, so one, one thing just to keep in mind, uh, the trust method is uh, measuring uh, oxygenation in the superior cytosinus, sinus. And it's uh, somewhat different from um, regional-based, uh, brain tissue-based approach. So th there's a recent study uh, just published uh, um, like a very recently uh, by Zhang Wu group. And so they look at the, um, like, a, again, similar to what they did, look at the superior cytosinus, sinus and, and then you can see using the trust method and you can see a reduction in sickle cell. Um, they also look at the, some deep, um, you know, like uh, for example, the internal cerebral vein. And then using the QSM method, we can you can see this is the sickle cell. It uh, shows a higher uh, value here, like uh, in OEF uh, compared to the control. And, and then if they use a different um, method and um, they also see sickle cell has a higher OEF compared to that. And then their conclusion in this paper is like uh, an oxygen extraction fraction probably in deep brain and structure is elevated, but not in the cerebral cortex. But again, this is a quite a different method. Uh, I was hoping that they could try the same method in the cerebral cytosinus sinus and to see what's going on, um, because this is still very depends on the calibration. Well, these two methods do not depend on the calibration. Okay, so the last um, clinical application I would like to talk about is uh, uh, CSVD. So for CSVD, um, it's uh, a lot of time you've heard about the vascular dementia. So it, it's really an, a major problem for elderly um, like a population. It, it costs about 20% of stroke. And also it, and the second leading cause of dementia uh, after Alzheimer's disease. And, and then there are uh, several risk factors. Actually, age is a risk factor. Um, and then hypertension and diabetes, uh, hyperlipidemia. And, and then we, we sort of have that hypothesis is uh, 
um, maybe there's an energy supply demand uh, mismatch, and then it may just uh, cause some chronic ischemic or hypoxic uh, condition in the tissue. Uh, so again, uh, you, you may think it's, uh, it looks uh, somewhat familiar uh, from the sickle cell examples I showed. Uh, so th this is a, a large study, and also looking at the one meta hyper intensity lesion density mask, and uh, like from, uh, I think, over 600 patients. Um, and then you can also see like uh, the lesion tends to occur in, in the watershed region. And so we, we call it the, really the location and maybe indicate quite a lot of things, right? The periventricular, what deep white matter regions, and they tend to um, like uh, more likely to develop a uh, white matter hyper intensity. Um, so again, this uh, is the watershed and physiology. And then we we define the watershed like uh, using blood flow, and we call it the physiological watershed. So we, we use, um, for example, the lowest the tenth percentile region, uh, which is the red region here, uh, to define um, like a region uh, perhaps with higher degree of vulnerability. And then we look at the, that um, CBF and OEF, and also um, the lesion density mask and then you can sort of see like uh, in those region and you when you see lower CBF and OEF tend to be higher. And, and then if we look at the lesion density and there's also a quite interesting uh, observation here is like a look at the CBF and with white matter regions with high heat uh, or lesion burden, you can see uh, the flow is low. And, and then if you look at the OEF, actually, um, they tend to be high in the same region. So we look at the, um, you know, some correlation between um, CBF versus uh, white matter hyperintensity or uh, normal appearing in white matter, like a fractional anisotropy uh, as a way to look at the microstructural impairments uh, or mean diffusivity. And then if you look at the first row here, it's the watershed CBF or doesn't seem to correlate with any of this. Well, if you look at OEF, actually there's a quite a strong correlation um, with the uh, white matter happy intensity, FA and MD. Um, and then if we sort of look into the multivariate linear regression by including age, sex, race, uh, all the risk factors and and then we, we find actually hypertension and the white matter OEF can explain 90, uh, close to 70% of the variance of uh, the white matter hyper intensity. And if we look at the um, mean diffusivity in the normal appearing white matter, this is the region that has not developed the white matter hyper intensity yet. And you can sort of use, uh, you see the OEF plus the hypertension explain about the uh, Forty-two point three percent of the variance, and then if we look at the white matter, uh, like a normal appearing white matter, fractional anisotropy, and OEF and the and diabetes can explain about thirty percent of the variance. And then we also look at the spatial lay and like uh, whether there's a gradient of uh, abnormalities. So like uh, the red region here is like a uh, white matter intensity. And then the yellow one is uh, the neighboring region around it. And then the green one is further away. So you can sort of see a nice gradient. And of uh, certainly this is the region that has not developed into one matter happy intensity yet, but you can see this is higher than region far away. So in summary, um, like uh, in acute stroke, um, we can use uh, OMI to distinguish penumbra. And, and then for sickle cell and the CSVD, we can see the watershed and elevation of OEF. Uh, and then um, these parameters change if some treatment uh, were provided to patients. And, and also uh, for CSVD, um, OEF seems to be a stronger uh, biomarker to predict. Okay, so uh, just very quickly, I, I want to um, acknowledge all my wonderful collaborators uh, and also funding sources. Thank you very much.